This is not your mother's middle age. No longer is waking up each day, living the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle acceptable. We have the life lessons, the relationships, the wins, and the losses with which to navigate to our highest self without hesitation and without fear leading the way. We have been there and done that, and so we have so much to offer the world and each other. So join me on this journey speaking to ordinary women doing extraordinary things for new insights, new ideas, new medical breakthroughs, and new life lessons. You will be inspired to find your best life here and now. My name is Wendy Charles McGuire, and this is your Second Wind Podcast. Welcome, Second Wind. As usual, today I have another fabulous lady with a more fabulous story. Her name is Jen Couch, aka Sober Sis. Um, You may be one of the 28,000 people that know who she is. However, if you don't, you're in for a treat. And if you do know who she is, you're still in for a treat because this is a great story that you may or may not know. She is a wife of 26 years, a mother of two humans, an ex Orvis store dealer. And we'll talk about that later. And now the sober sis founder and game changer of life. Might have said that backwards. It might be more like game of life changer. I like that one better. We'll use that. And what started as a personal six week challenge for her turned into a hundred days, turned into a life practice. And then the sober sis movement, which is over four years old and growing. Welcome Jen to second win the podcast. Thank you so much, Wendy. It has been so fun getting to know you this year from afar And now to bring you in closer with me, I'm excited to get to know you too. And thank you for having me. You are so welcome. And yeah, this was just me sitting in a conference being really bored because I didn't really feel like I needed to uh, heal my inner child. And uh, (laughs) it's like, yeah, pretty good. Got a lot of work. And I'm like going through Instagram and there you pop up and I'm like, ooh, she's cool. And, And truth be told, personally, I've always thought, Hmm. Did I, did I maybe have an extra glass of wine that I shouldn't have? Do I, do I feel kind of yucky this next day? Like, I don't think I have an issue with drinking, but do I like when you start asking yourself that question and I, you know, you, you do the healthy things, you work out, you, you're there, you're present. And then six o'clock hits and you're like, it is my time for that glass of wine. This girl deserves it. And, um, getting to know you, diving into your program and and doing the 20 way 21 day reset challenge. um, It was pretty eye opening. And, and I was just sharing with Jen before we started the podcast. I'm like, yeah, so I might add a couple glasses of wine last night. And because I haven't really been doing that or needing it or wanting it, I just felt yucky for probably the first six hours of my day to day. And that's the only thing I can think of that has changed. Yeah. So, that was interesting, but I want to jump interesting. right. And I'm so glad yeah. that you brought that up. Like, I'm so glad that you didn't like omit that from our discussion because so much of what we talk about in sober sis is about how it's really all about a practice practicing. Mm-hmm. And so that's not about perfection. And that's not about drawing these huge lines in the sand where, um, you know, until you're, until one day you realize you have drawn the line in the sand and you are ready. But for a lot of people, they just enter sober sis to tap the brakes, pull off the drinking highway and just hit a rest stop for a minute. You know, like so it doesn't have that. to be this big, I'm never drinking again. It can be more like I can do what I want to do. Maybe I can change what my desires are so that I'm still in alignment doing what it is I want to do. Yeah. So maybe we should, maybe we should, cause this is such a, it's just such a huge topic 
to me yeah. And, yeah. and for the people I know around me that maybe we should start with what is sober sis? Let's start there and then we can dissect your story and how you got there. Cause that's a really good story. But I think people are probably going, what the heck are they talking about? Yeah. Well, sober sis is really short for sober minded sisters. And I use the word sober minded because we're really not a sobriety group. We're really not like a sobriety club or like AA or other places that you really would associate with full on sobriety and abstinence. The goal of sober sis is the reason why I created it is I really created what I wish I could have found which is a network, a real community of women from all over the world, from all different walks of life at all different places within the drinking spectrum, but that usually fall in that gray area, kind of in the middle. Like they can't, they can take it or leave it, but they're usually taking it more than they're leaving it, but they can walk away. It's not yes. physical addiction yet, although I do believe that the drinking spectrum is kind of a one direction. We typically don't drink less and less over the years. If you're a drinker, you typically tend to drink more or more often than you did at the beginning. And so I help women, um, just like I said, kind of tap the brakes, kind of pull off the drinking highway, look at their relationship with alcohol, renegotiate that without any labels, no shame needed. That doesn't do any good anyway. No rules, not judgment. Um, but more of an exploratory, let me learn, let me discover, let me make some friends that are like-minded that are also wanting to, to change up their wine o'clock habit. And maybe we can do it together and it's not so hard or so bad. Maybe this could actually be, dare I say, kind of, kind of fun, <laughs> kind of fun to not drink versus this drudgery, this misery, this deprivation mindset. I'm kind of here to say, oh, wait, what if we have more options and we feel more empowered and we don't feel alone? Maybe we can change wine o'clock for ourselves. Wine o'clock. Yeah. And I, and I know that, you know, I, I love a good cocktail party and all the yummy oh, yeah. food and all that. And then it's great. And then you're, you, you feel like you're in control and you feel like you're, you're doing everything right. But somehow yeah. by the time you get home, it's, it's not a good Like, why did I eat that? Oh, because I drank two or three glasses of wine and then I ate stuff that I normally wouldn't have. And everything you did for the week before the ladies night, you just tossed in the trash. It's, it's, it's it's interesting. It's such a cycle. I call it the detox, just a retox cycle, because that's exactly what it is. It's like you're detoxing with your green juice and your, you know, yoga, this is all like detox, like lemon oil in your water, you know, which I do all those things. And then I would turn right back around in the same kitchen that I just juiced kale in. And I would open a bottle of Pinot Grigio and proceed to retox my body with uh, something that my body was going to have to spend all evening just trying to rid itself up versus burning oh, yeah. calories or helping me with sleep or anything else that I wanted. Yeah. And biologically, biologically, what I was told um, by Eliza Baco, who I did the GI mapping with here on Second Wind, is that your liver can't do a whole bunch of stuff at once. So when you introduce the alcohol, it says, fine, I'll go deal with this over here now. And your food doesn't get dealt with. Right. And that's exactly right. It turns when you go to bed, it goes to bed, it goes to sleep. And then around, you know, I know for a fact, many of the women around me have that four o'clock in the morning, wake up or hot sweat, wake up, or I don't feel good, wake up. And it was correlated to when your liver wakes back up and now has to take care of the toxins left in it from the stuff you drank. And the yeah. food you ate. Yeah, I call and it the 3 a.m. wake like up crap. call. <laughs> yeah, the three, yeah. What did you say? You I call it, it the 3 a.m. wake up call. And it's that waking a. up a. with a, maybe a little bit of a, of a, maybe even a racing heartbeat, some anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's an anxiety. anxiety there that's chemical. It's a chemical produced anxiety from the alcohol itself. 
So it's funny. I mean, it's, it's funny, not funny. I used to drink to subdue some of my anxiety, what I thought was subduing, but all I was doing was pouring uh, gasoline on the fire of my anxiety it would numb it for a while. So I thought it worked, but it was at 3 a.m. I woke up with the feeling of kind of anxiety again, a little bit of dread, like, oh no, this is not going to be good. I got to wake up in three more hours from now, start getting the kids to school, getting my workout stuff going on. And like you were describing how you felt this morning, you can do all that stuff, but not at full capacity, not at full throttle. And I was doing that on the regular. Oh yeah. You can, you can act like everything's fine. And then when you get in your car from the meeting oh, yeah. like I did this morning, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah, you know? totally. Totally. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. So that, that gives us an idea of this. Let's, let's go to that moment when you decided enough's enough. I'm going to, your second win moment really is what it is totally. for you. It was the drinking, right? So let's talk about that. Talk about that moment when you're like, okay, changing my change in the plan here, change in the route. Well, good question, Wendy. You know, I knew for me, if I wanted to show up different at 50, than I did 40. Mm -hmm. It was not going to be an overnight thing or even a 30 day juice cleanse or anything like that. Cause I've already tried that. Um, I, I was living a very status quo, uh, life getting by looking good, looking like everybody else around me, kind of drinking like most of my friends. Um, it, and for me, I just felt like, oh, I'm living out of alignment with who I really am because I'm this divided mind. I'm not this wholehearted mind. I'm one person by day, another person by night. Well, you have this I, little tiny secret. Yeah. Oh, totally. And right? I had such good intentions in the morning. And then I would break my own promises mm -hmm. to myself, which is actually really painful to repeatedly break promises to yourself. So there was a time there where I was like, well, never mind. I just won't make promises to myself. I'll just drink what I want when I want. And so I would put all these guardrails on and all these rules. And then I would just take them off and be like, never mind. So I was a yo-yo drinker, basically. Instead of a yo-yo dieter, I was a yo-yo drinker. Um, and again, nothing bad ever happened. I never got a DUI, never lost anything. Externally, things looked fine. It was internally that I was having this tug of war. And um, yeah, so it was in 2017, I really started uh, catching wind, to use your word, catching wind of so many wonderful coaches and programs and podcasts and books out there. Really, honestly, too many to name. It was more of a cumulative effect that happened for me that spring and summer where I was introduced to so many facets of the science about alcohol that I had no clue. I didn't know about the science of alcohol. All I saw was the marketing and messaging to women mm -hmm. saying, oh, it's fine. You deserve it. Mm -hmm. It's your reward. Rosé all day. Wear the t-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, and so I began to push back against that. And I began to question that. And instead of just trying to quit drinking again, or just not drink like in a white knuckling willpower kind of way, I really started to learn about drinking. And I started to learn about my cravings and my habits and why I was drinking in the first place. And um, that set me on a journey that set me on course. And there were a lot of changes in my family going on during that time. My oldest was graduated from high school and was in her freshman year of college and was about to make a huge move. And I just knew as a mom, I needed all hands on deck. I needed my clear mind to be able to support her and not drag around this anxiety and this double mindedness. And so that was also a huge catalyst to, you know, she's getting a fresh start. She's changing seasons. Well, why can't I get my second wind and change seasons too? Wow. Maybe this is my time to kind of get to reinvent myself. We've just been through a five year, you know, uh, challenging time, kind of her 13 to 18 was my 40 to 45. So here she is, you know, at a jumping off point to make some new changes in her life. And I thought, you know what? I'm at a jumping off point too. I, I think I want to do some things different. 
And that, that was my journey in 2017, learning, growing. Um, and so by the time 2018 hit, I had really begun to practice this lifestyle of sober-minded living, of being present, of not checking out when things got hard or boring or lonely, or to even celebrate. And wow. um, yeah, so that that's kind of where it all began for me, was just okay. needing a change. I was just really uncomfortable with... Uh, the detox, just to retox loop, the groundhog day feeling was wearing me out. Yeah. The loop, right? The loop was, was <laughs> what was so painful. It was the, I'm not going to, but I know I'm going to. So why do I, yes. even, you know, like I'm setting myself up for failure almost every day. Again, I'll be <laughs> and like after a while, home. I'll be driving home and I, and I have every intention of, not having anything to drink and I've got plenty to do. It's not like I don't have animals to feed and things to do and right. exercise. And I, and I'm like, Oh, but if I, if I turn here, I can go to the cute little store and get the cute little wine and then go home. And then I, I drink it, Yep. you know, and, and then I don't exercise. And then the rest of the night's a bit of just kind of a wash for me. It was anyway. You know, and I, I talk a lot about, you know, doing the bottle breakdown. Um, have I told you bottle? about that? I do not know. Have we talked about, the bottle? I know we took a lot of notes that day talking, but we haven't talked about the bottle breakdown. Because, but I love taking the notes. <laughs> well, that's good. I loved it. Yeah, good. Um, tell me, what is the bottle breakdown? The bottle breakdown. Okay. Well, you know, and I started drinking a little bit later in my life. I started drinking, um, you know, on a habitual, like regular time in my young thirties, I was not your teenage drinker. I even went to a state school. I went to Texas tech. I was in a sorority and I was not really a drinker then. Yeah, and that been we were very, time. very similar. It wasn't until after I got time. Time. Yeah. yeah. So really I was a married mom working when I started drinking where to the point that I noticed, okay, this is getting a little bit big in my life. Yeah, I'd had a few drinks before, but it was so small in my life. I wouldn't really count myself as being into drinking until here I was in network marketing at happy hours. And I'm like, whoa, this mommy juice, <laughs> this elixir is awesome. Where have I been? Um, yeah, tell me about, but let me interrupt you really quick because there was this, there was a moment when one of your coworkers, right. you're at a hotel, right. Right? right? Tell that because that was, that was really a moment. It was a defining moment. I can remember it vividly because I, it's almost like I stepped into the drinking world. Yeah. It's like I stepped into the arena of becoming a quote drinker because I, before that I was effectively a non-drinker. Yeah. I'd have a drink here and there, but I mean, again, I mean, I could count on one hand and it wasn't because I was trying so hard not to drink. It was just not in my world. My parents didn't drink. My husband and I didn't meet drinking. It was not something we did together as an activity yet. <laughs> Don't worry. Right. We, we did for a solid decade and a half. Right. But at that point, it was not our thing. We had been building our family, building our business. We were building, 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 not drinking, drinking, drinking. And um, yeah, so my, my friend, we were at this happy hour at a hotel and she goes, Jen, why don't you get a glass of wine with us, girl? And I was like, you know what? Why, why don't I like, seriously, I kind of went through the rules in my head that I'd been taught as a young person. Like, don't, don't drink if you're not 21. Cause that's the law. Okay. I'm a law abiding citizen. <laughs> I'm a rule follower. I'm an Enneagram one. Um, okay. <laughs> got it. Um, don't drink and drive. Okay. Got it. And don't drink to get drunk. Like that's like from a faith standpoint, like that was kind of like, Ooh, a sin. Like, don't drink to get drunk, but right. Jesus turned water into wine. So let's go. Those were the rules I had in my head and I like could check them all. I'm like, hello, I'm 32. I didn't even drive myself here. So don't worry about that. And I'm certainly not going to drink to get drunk. I don't even, I've not even been drunk yet in my life at that point, which I know for some of your listeners, they are perplexed right now. They're out there going, excuse me, what? Can you say that again? Yeah. yeah and I had 30s. my throw up episodes for and sure. I had not, I had not crossed that line yet where my body had revolted against what I'd put into it yet. 
<laughs> Don't worry. I catch up in my 30s, which was super embarrassing for me yeah. as a married mom to not so be you- able to know my limits, which I had yeah. to learn very quickly because it was embarrassing. So that's what I did is um, I allowed her to order for me because I didn't even really know what to order right. to like start me out. So she ordered me oh a white gosh. Zinfandale and I was like, well, that's pretty. It's kind of pink. <laughs> it was harmless and it's so sweet and it really tastes good. And then, oh my gosh, whoop, whoop, just this feeling washed over me of like, oh, let your hair down, breathe a little deeper. And I didn't know that I was really wound up probably as tight as I was and probably wasn't breathing as deep as I should. I didn't even know. For me, it was a real like vulnerable moment with myself where I didn't realize how much I'd been kind of holding in and probably posturing in my life. And so for me, it was a real like, whoa, um, I like this. And I really didn't have a cautionary tale in my life of someone around me who had struggled with addiction or alcohol. So for me, I'm like, oh, I'm just late to the party. I'll catch up. This is not going to be a problem. How could it be for me? How could it be in my mind? These were the things my mind was telling me. You're like the the perfect model. Yeah. I'm like, how could this ever be a problem for me? I'm 32. Um, I don't, I don't see myself as someone that's ever going to be drinking more than I want to. I barely even want to drink now. So how could this happen to me? And that's where I bring in the bottle breakdown. Because what happened is I started by just drinking one glass. One glass Mm -hmm. at a time was enough for this mama. One glass would do me in. I was like floating. Warm fuzzies. Did you get warm fuzzies and just kind of floating through life? And I was like, that rocks two glasses. Whoa. Had to build up to the two glasses. It probably just took me months, not days, but you know, I, I got my two glasses and then it took the two glasses to get the one glass effect that I had had before. Oh yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking about? So it's like, okay, now the two glasses feels like the one glass. Well, I like the one glass feeling. I just want to keep chasing that. I'm not trying to be the drunk mom. I'm not trying to overdo it. I don't want to drink in excess. I don't want to hurt my body. I don't want to undo my workout. I just want to feel like I do after that first class throughout the whole evening. So I guess I need another one. (laughs) That's my mindset and my body. You know, alcohol really does create a thirst for itself. So that second glass was really kind of the first glass idea. It was like first glass was like, nope. I think you need another one. Okay. And so first class for me at home, uh, because I worked up to not just drinking socially, but just drinking in my house Mm -hmm. alone with people, without people. I was my own party. And so usually it was about five o'clock, which I call wine o'clock. And that was like my cue, my trigger to like transition from my day to my evening and start doing the four hour evening shift of cooking, cleaning and homework management and all that. So that's for you moms out there, you know, that's a laborious kind of bewitching time. Or if you've got little ones, it's like, okay, when's my time to take a break? Um, And so that's what I would do is I would kind of crack open that bottle of wine with the intent of having a glass or two. But over time, that second glass wasn't really cutting it because it felt like that first glass felt like it wasn't enough to maintain the feeling I was wanting two, three hours later. So the bottle breakdown happened where I would have the first glass while I was getting the dinner started. Like picture me, you know, popping the ragu lid, putting it in the skillet. The noodles are boiling. That's going to take a good minute. And so I'm just going to have a glass of wine while all that's happening. I mean, yeah. that's what they do, you know, in Italy, I went in Rome, you Absolutely. know, so let's, let's do that. And that's what I'm seeing on TV. That's what I'm seeing in the movies. That's what I know my girlfriends are doing. So it feels very justified and normal that at five o'clock I would start drinking and I would have my first glass, Wendy, and I'd be done with it at like five 30. And that's me sipping. 30 minutes for a glass of wine. I mean, I'm sipping and I'm really wanting to I think drink. Mine goes faster. down faster. I think mine I'm wanting down. to drink faster, but I'm trying to like pace it out because I've got all night long. So it's 5 30, let's say, and I've drugged out that first glass as long as I possibly can, <laughs> which was about 30 minutes. I mean, 
long time. And so I was like, well, it's only 530. Um, ah, let's have a little bit more. People are running late. The, the dinner's still going. Or maybe it's time to eat. There's glass number two. Great. There we go. But are we done yet? No. Glass number three comes in. When I'm back in the kitchen, now everyone is scattered. I don't know what it was like at your house with with younger kids, but everyone leaves. Like, where did they go? Like, I just fed them. Now everyone's got like practice or homework and I'm in the kitchen by myself, all the skillets, all the pans, all the work. And that's when I felt like, you know what? I am just going to have a little bit more. I'm going to turn on my 80s music. I'm going to get my Pandora going and I'm going to have that third glass. And then by the time I have that third glass, now I'm really feeling it. And I'm looking at the bottle and there's this much left, right? There's that right. quarter left and I'm in Texas. So we get four glasses per bottle. I don't know right. if you get five, but no, I get, we get four. It's all the same. Four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would get four. four. So that fourth glass would be, you know what? This is a little bit embarrassing now. I cannot believe that I've had that much wine by myself, my husband, my family, they may not even know. It's not like I'm so affected at this point. I've built up tolerance and I've built up some dependence as well because they go hand in hand. So I've built up some tolerance. So I've also built up some dependence like this feels good. I got to keep going. And so I would look at the bottom of the bottle and think to myself, well, that's certainly not enough to say for tomorrow because by itself, it's just going to be frustrating. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's dumb to have a quarter of a bottle. I mean, that's just enough to wet your whistle and get you going. So that's not enough to save. And if I drink it right now, I can actually recycle the bottle and act like it never happened to myself. Like I can just go have that in the bathtub, recycle the bottle and call it a day and just be like, whoop, dang it. I drank a bottle of wine again. And if you would have told me that at age 40, I could drink a bottle of wine on my own and be completely high functioning, um, to do everything that I needed to do, hit all my marks, be on point, wake up, get it all done again. I would have said, you've got to be kidding. There's no way. There's no way I could drink a whole bottle of wine. Well, yes, you can. And I work with women every day who have worked up to two bottles of wine. Oh, yeah. And they're super high functioning. And would they consider themselves someone with a drinking problem? You know, actually, probably so, because they're Googling Hey, if you're out there and you're Googling, am I an alcoholic? Do I drink too much at three in the morning? That's a red flag. I'm not here to label anyone. I don't think that's helpful. Um, And I do think there is a difference between someone who's physically addicted to the point they can't stop on their own to someone who really can set it down. But it is a physically addictive substance. It's working and your brain is working to to crave it, to want more of it. You're not broken. Just your pattern is broken. And so that's what had happened to me. My pattern got broken. My routine got dependent on that wine o'clock. And uh, I just had to put a stop to it eventually. <laughs> Gosh. So what, what was it that in 2017 made you start researching it? What was it? Because how you just were doing your thing, you were high functioning, you're playing the games with yourself and your mind. Yes. Yes. And then, and then maybe I'd go a few days and did I really drink every single day this week? Oh my God. Yes. All right. I'm just not going to drink on Sunday. Let's, let's just start there. Right. And then Monday would come around like, oh, well, I didn't have any yesterday. Right. And then, right. So, so you're doing all this. There's no, there's no really downside that you're willing to look at, right? Right. I don't have a catalyst. I don't have an external event happen that forces my hand to change. Um, But I think in God's great mercy and design, he put people in my path to learn from, to hear from, to see, to understand that there was this community of alcohol-free people that would not use the words like addiction, sobriety, um, recovery. And if those words resonate with people, I think that's great for me personally, especially at that time, those words didn't resonate with me. I didn't identify. And so when I would hear those words, I was like, Ooh, okay. Well, I know I don't want to be addicted or be an addict or be, I don't, I don't know, but I just knew for me, 
hearing words like um, alcohol-free lifestyle. Um, being a Christian, being a person of faith, I went back always to the verse that, that talks about be of sober mind. And that always stood out to me. It's in first Peter. And it always stood out to me like being of sober mind means being awake, alert, aware in your own life for the devil. The enemy prowls around looking for whom he can devour. Like that's an actual mm. Bible verse. Yeah. And I felt that way. Like I was just kind of leaving myself wide open to a lot of things in my life that were subjecting me to more anxiety and stress and pressure than I needed to. And because I had let go of my sober mind, my alert, aware, awake in my own life in the evenings, that's where I felt also that God wanted to partner with me, if that makes sense. Yeah, I felt like I wanted to partner with me because as a Christian, this is kind of how I describe it. It was like I would be on my back patio <laughs> and I've had my great time in the Bible that morning, you know, connecting in my personal relationship with God through reading his word and just opening my heart to hear. But that night I would be on the same patio, Wendy, the same patio that I'd had my Bible time that morning, I'm still wanting to have that same uh, connection with God. But now I've put something in between us. I've said, well, God, I love you. And I want to depend on you and seek you for my comfort and my strength. However, <laughs> I really want to bring someone else into the party with us. I'm going to call mm. it drinking. I'm going to call it wine. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to kind of serve you both. Like I kind of want to have you as my my master, you as the one in my life that, that I lean on uh, master may not be a good word, but like lean on God, lean on God. And what I found was I was inviting God into my problems, but leaning on wine, leaning on drinking. Oh, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. And so that okay. caused a lot of inner turmoil for me because I felt that double-minded divided life. And so instead of God being a, like a master, like a taskmaster and taking it away from me and going, no, you will love me only. And I will take that drink away from you in his patience and kindness. He allowed me to partner with him, to give it up, to give it to him instead of wow. saying, oh, take it away. Really? I've thought about it now for, for quite some time. What would it have looked like for God to literally take it away? Would it have to be a crisis? Would it have to be a tragedy? Oh, I see what you're for saying. For God to literally take it away? Instead, in his patience and kindness, I believe he waited for me to get to my own rock bottom, which was a pretty high bottom out there in the world of drinking. But I got to my own rock bottom where I just said, you know what? I'm tired of fighting you on this and I don't want you to take it away. It sounds so like intense. I'd rather give it to you and partner with you to not want it so much. I'd rather lean on you than it, but I'm not even sure how to do that because I really like how it makes me feel. And I can't always feel you as solid and, and real as I do this drink. But so that's what I had to figure out. But what was your rock bottom? I guess that's my question. What did you have a rock bottom? You know, no, no, I really didn't. It was really the cumulative effect of years of the in and out, up and down. I'm going to quit. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to drink less. I'm going to drink more. I'm going to, it really, honestly, in fact, ironically, when I did embark on this journey to start learning, I was actually at a really good spot with my drinking. I was actually at kind of one of my highlight real <laughs> drinking times. I had not just like, been nursing a huge hangover when I started finding all the information that led me to, to where I am today. It was really more of a, no, I'm really, I'm kind of in a good place. And that I think is a key message because it's never too early or too late to change your relationship with, with alcohol. I think for me, there was a point in time there where I was almost waiting for it to get worse so I can almost qualify for more help or support mm -hmm. instead of going, no, I can look at this anytime. It, I can look at this just because I don't feel good about it. Not because someone in the world is telling me I have to. Right. Oh my God. And that felt really good. So I really entered into this alcohol-free journey 
kind of on my own terms as far as um, it had been years in the making. It had been right. years coming. Um, but again, I think that I was just ready. I was so ready for a change. I was so uncomfortable with the routine I was in that I was just so ready for a change. And that really led me to getting a really compelling why, a real big why, which is I just don't want to keep going back to where I've been. I've got to go someplace new. Yeah. You said, I don't want my, f- when I turn 50 to look like 40. Yeah. I wanted 40, to I was, you know, different. overweight, overwhelmed, overdone, overcooked out there with just the heat of life. And not that I showed up at 50, just easy breezy cover girl where everything's like awesome. And I so mean, you kind of look like that. I'm just saying, but well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's the lighting. It's the O-ring. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So then you decide in 2017, you start diving into all this and did you stop drinking then? Or were you just doing the research? Like, How did this evolve to where you said, okay, I'm giving myself six weeks because that's kind of a big, that's a big thing to do for yourself to yourself. Oh, for sure. Did you have any support? And like you had drinking buddies, like what happened? You had friends that like, how does. Yeah. Yeah, My first night that I was really embarking on this new goal, this commitment was book club. (laughs) When, you know, it was a Monday night and, uh, That was kind of my quote day one. I didn't know it was like my day one of not drinking, but it was my day one of a commitment and a challenge. And so, so yeah, that was big. That was real big. Um, I did have some support. I did have some online support, but I didn't have relational support with a person, anyone I knew, anyone that I could see feel touch or that I knew was walking it out where I could peek into their real life, real time. And so, mm-hmm. you know, online programs, books, podcasts, they're all a piece of the puzzle, but that was what was lacking for me most in 2017 was feeling like I could get into relationship with people who were doing this versus just learning. Right. Right. If that makes but, sense. But yes. But take so. I like the picture, right? So take me into that book club that night. Oh, okay. Yeah. Take me yeah. there. Because so well, many of us club, are like, yeah, I want to do that. I'm just not sure what that would look like. And yeah. maybe you can share. Well, okay. And I started this book club five years previous with three other girls. And we had a rotation of nine neighbors that were oh in gosh. this book club. So I was like a founder of the book club. I was a consistent regular member. And every time we got together once a month, on Mondays, it was definitely a BYOB, bring your own bottle type situation. Yeah. And more than likely, we would end up drinking three or four glasses in the three hours that we were together. Always yeah. lots of fun, lots of food. We got the cheese tray. We might actually talk about the book briefly. For get a moment. To the book. <laughs> sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't, but lots of laughing, lots of fun. Um, very diverse group, which I really enjoy. It it wasn't like everyone was cookie cutter like me, different, um, you know, religious views, political views. Uh, I loved that. That was one of my favorite things about that book club in particular, which is now disbanded for me because I got a little bit busy with sober sis, but, um, but that first night, I did bring something in. I brought a bottle of uh, like a Belfour lemonade that I had found at World Market. I did not yet know the vast array of alcohol-free options that have now increased a thousand times since I began this journey four years ago. I mean, that's one of my things I get really passionate about is promoting all these companies on Instagram, just because I want more women to know how many choices they actually do have. Right. And I brought in one of the choices I knew of, and I set it down on the island right next to all the chips and dips, just like everybody else, and opened it and quickly poured uh, some in my glass so that I was holding something. Right. It looked very much like everyone else's. I did get a couple of people go, huh, Jen, what's this? And I'm like, oh, it's this, it's this, you know, carbonated lemonade basically that I found. And, uh, 
yeah, I'm just taking a break tonight. Just not huh. drinking tonight. I'm just taking a break. I didn't go into any big commitment on on drinking or why I wasn't drinking. Um, I didn't really feel like I needed to justify it, but it did feel like a challenge for mm-hmm. sure. And I had to really pre-decide before I went that no matter what, just tonight, like I couldn't even think about the next day. I was really right. just trying to get through that night. Tonight, I'm going to give myself practice at not drinking someplace where I've drank every single time for years. That's really hard. And that was like, okay. And I left there and I was like, oh my gosh, I did it. Hmm. And it was really not that awkward. It was really not that bad because you know what? People really didn't care what was in my glass. Yeah. What's the initial their glass? Right. Once the initial little Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. And you and just nobody gives it. Only fake it till you make it. Like I kind of yeah. walked in with more confidence than I really felt. And I just was so desperate for change in my own life beyond that Monday night, that that Monday night was worth it to me to be a little bit uncomfortable because I was going to be uncomfortable at 3 a.m. anyway, if I drank. So <laughs> might as well pick one. I'm going to be uncomfortable. And it was just for about a couple of minutes when I first walked in and then I got through it. And then the very next, not the next night, but that Wednesday, I'll never forget it. It was very memorable to me. Um, That Wednesday, I went to my friend's 50th birthday party and it was uh, at an awesome venue. You'd have to know my friend. It was her, her name is Jana. And it was an all out beautiful birthday party, like a row of like a hundred chairs with all these tables put together, this massive, beautiful event. And there was a bottle of red wine per two people. So there were 50 bottles of wine on this huge long table. And there was enough wine for everyone basically to split a bottle at the party to have two glasses. And it was my day three. It was like, hello, people. It's just Wednesday. I'm not even to the weekend yet. Right, right. I'm not even in the weekend. That's how integral drinking was in my life. And I know many of your listeners are like, oh, my gosh, yes. That was just a a Monday and a Wednesday during the week. And it is in my face. Like I am, I'm feeling it, but I got through it. And not only did I get through it, but I felt really good about myself when I got in the car and I drove away, having not had two glasses of wine, driving from this obscure venue, you know, even that felt good because I had all my wits about me. There was none of that foggy mind while I'm driving, which is mm-hmm. scary now to me looking back. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, well, I guess I'll do it again Thursday. What's going on Thursday? Oh, probably live music somewhere with my husband or a happy hour oh. for real estate. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll do it again Thursday. I had to get away from focusing on what I was losing and focusing on the drinking and focusing on what I was gaining and focusing on this new life that I was building. And I couldn't quite see it yet, but I knew if I just kept not drinking that I could get someplace new. And that was my only goal initially was you can kick, you can cry, you can scream, you can get on Amazon Prime and order bath bombs till there's no tomorrow. But don't drink, Jen. That was kind of my mantra was like, just just don't drink. And uh And and that's what I did is I set smaller goals for myself. Six weeks, a hundred days was my next goal because I just couldn't imagine. And I know many of you out there listening and you cannot imagine not drinking alcohol for a hundred days until like the story. True story. Yeah. And you know, physically you can, but you're not even sure if you would want to. But you do want to, but you're, you're hedging your bets saying, I don't know if I want to, because you don't know if you can Mm -hmm. and do it well and do it thriving. I mean, you know, you can do it. Why knuckling it miserable? I mean, again, I am talking to that gray area drinker for some of you out there. If you can't get three days or an hour or a day under your belt physically, then you might need to seek more help than what I can offer in sober sis. And that's okay. I'm all for getting the help you need. But for many of us, I had done these little challenges, but a hundred days, that was like a new ball game. That was a new ball game. What were some benefits? Like, were you seeing any benefits or were, or was it like, yeah, this isn't changing my life. My mother, my adoptive mother 
can drink and would drink alone at night. My father died and, you know, it, it was a considerable amount. She never, you would never say she got drunk or anything, but I, and then she stopped drinking um, for a while. And I'd be like, so how do you feel? Is it all better? Do you feel different? Do you have more energy? She's like, no, everything's the same. And I'm kind of like, well, then what's the benefit? <laughs> what's why, are the we, benefit? why are we doing that? Why, yeah. So what's, the, were there benefits that you could find right away? Or I think my mother's lying to me. First of all, she doesn't want to admit that there was something going on. So that aside, were you feeling benefits right away or, or was it over time or what was happening? That's a great question. And I do get asked that a lot with women who take the 21 day reset because they're like, what should I even expect in 21 days if I actually go alcohol free? And I always tell people the first seven to 10 days are really the hardest because that's how long it takes for alcohol and the effects of alcohol to really get out of your system. So most people don't, most regular habitual social, we'll call them you regular drinkers, never go 10 days without drinking. Mm -hmm. You might go three or four, like I won't drink during the week and I'll just drink on the weekends. You're still always in that seven to 10 day window. So alcohol is always in your system or the effects of it, you've not yet reached that homeostasis balance or that okay. clear mind. It can't come that's that quick. So when people are expecting big changes, like immediately, I mean, yes, you're going to feel better just automatically because your body is not working on getting rid of a toxin. But I would right. say there is something magical, if you will, that happens after the first week because the fog the brain fog really does start to lift. Um, okay. Doesn't completely go away, but I would say that was the first thing that started going away. It's just that that static that I felt in my brain to focus and concentrate that improved pretty quickly. My that was like your to first focus. sign. That yes. was like your first. Okay, interesting. Okay. Yep. My ability to literally focus and concentrate without my eyes hurting or feeling this swirly, foggy mind. But Jen, um, did you even know that that would be something that would happen? Did you even know you were in that fog? No, no. Yeah, that's that was the, the thing. thing is I was living in it and I just thought it was just par for the course. I just thought it was just perimenopause. I'm getting older, like get stressful. Older. It's, you know, hot outside. My husband snores. Nobody's really sleeping. I mean, I didn't know how bad I felt until I started to feel better. (laughs) And then I was like, wow, I did not know how much I was settling for. Like I was really settling for a subpar experience in life because I thought it was normal and everything kind of had this homogenous, dull tint to it. Like I'm going to get up. I'm going to work out. I'm going to kind of minimize any hangover feelings. And people have these conceptions that a hangover is debilitating. It can be. I've certainly had a handful. But most of the time that hang, hanging over from the night before, it's like you described earlier. Just don't feel 100%. You're okay. still getting stuff done. You're you're getting it done out there. I have no doubt. Um, but you know what I mean? It's you're just not at full capacity, full throttle. And uh yeah, so I noticed the brain fog uh, start to lift my attention and just my focus and ability. My anxiety levels started decreasing pretty quickly as well in the first couple of weeks. That um, literal kind of restless, nervous, worrisome feeling that foreboding feeling that I had that I always wanted to alter or eject out of my own life from started to dissipate. And I could just have more perspective. It was like, okay, things don't seem that big of a deal that just two weeks ago would have made me cry or Mm. be so sad or so angry. All my emotions when I was drinking were just so much more amplified. And what I noticed when I, when I stopped drinking is my emotions were still there, but they weren't as loud. I could feel more in control of my emotions or at least begin to feel them before when I was feeling them, I just numbed them so fast. I was like, uh Oh, anxiety. 
gulp, gulp, you're out of here. Oh anger. my gosh. Yes. It's like anger. No problem. Sauvignon Blanc can take care of you. I'll just squelch you down. God, I love me some Sauvignon Blanc. Let me also <laughs> tell you that when I did the 20, I've already done Jen's 21 day reset, which was right after the whole 30 where you also don't drink. So I was kind of like already there. And, um, I, it's like, you have a different sort of energy and motivation for the day. Things are crisper, right? You're just yeah. like, yeah, I can go do that. Not like, you know, I would much rather have a glass of wine and sit down and just take, take it, take it easy for myself. You don't right. even think like that when the alcohol is not present. Right. Is that right. what you felt too? Totally. And I just took it off the table. And I didn't say forever, always, never. I just took it off the table for these incremental times. And I was like, you know what? It's just off the table right now. So I'm going to have to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more curious about my own Mm -hmm. life and my own feelings and not just go for this same thing. And so, yeah, I really got to know myself quickly early on and and have continued to ever since because I just, yeah just present in my own life. It helps you expand. I think you even said that, totally. that you, get, you get clear on your whys and it changes you and expands you. And yeah, that I was very narrow. I was very limited in my uh, thinking and in, in my resilience. That's another thing that, that changed for me. Not only did I start, you know, finding that I was sleeping better, more energy, less anxiety. Um, I didn't lose weight right away. But really by about eight weeks, the pounds started dropping off. I lost all in about 15 pounds the first six months just by not drinking. And because it was the lead domino for me, drinking the lead domino, it was the lead domino because drinking wasn't my only problem. (laughs) Drinking was just my main thing that if I could change that, I would sleep better, which if I'm sleeping better, then I'm going to wake up and want to eat better. If I'm eating better, I'm going to want to work out more. If I'm working out more, I'm going to stay more hydrated. It's like everything started adding up in a positive direction instead of mm-hmm. a negative direction. That's such a great analogy. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I highlighted that in my notes. Yeah. Like yeah. Domino effect, Cause that makes so much sense. So how how did you turn this into sober sis? Because yeah. you don't need to do that. I mean, you work, you and your husband worked hard. You guys met in college, right? Right. You had already been engaged. You didn't even really, he was just a good dancer, right? Exactly. That was and, my criteria. <laughs> and then you guys got married. The minute he graduated, you're a couple of years older. And Correct. then you go and you open an Orvis store together. You were hard workers. And yeah. here you are now And Orvis for people who don't know, go ahead, explain Orvis in case you're not. Yeah. So Orvis is a national outdoor retail company. And my husband worked at an outdoor retail shop when we were at Texas Tech as college students. And that's what got us to Fort Worth, Texas is we bought as a 23 and 25 year old I was the 25 year old. Uh, we <laughs> bought an Orvis dealership, which for, for those of you who don't know, it, it doesn't matter, but a dealership's a little bit different than a franchise. We actually owned the inventory, but carried the Orvis name. And Orvis is a name in fly fishing. Um, yeah. And believe it or not, here in Texas, there are a lot of fly fisher men and women that go to Colorado, Wyoming, and whatnot, but live here. And so it, it made sense for us to do that. So in our young 20s, we were building business, building family and entrepreneurs. We're both third generation entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and uh, building and making our own business just seemed normal to us. Right. And now your kids in college, your kids are in college, yeah. you're doing your own thing. And, and, and I love it because the second wind is finding your purpose, right. finding your passion, being true to who you are. I hate the word alignment, but it really is. And yeah. then, you know, wherever that leads you, whatever that looks like. And then you took on this whole, I mean, this thing has blown the heck up. Like it is, you have a team of people now. And this is you, what, on Christmas, a year after doing your dive in. Right. 2017, 2018, you're sitting right. there on your couch at Christmas going, what? Say, say what you thought. 
Yeah. Well, it it really was Christmas day evening. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I just made it through like all the major holidays, my birthday, my anniversary, all the like drinking fest holidays that all kick off in October. It's like a three month drinking fest. I just made it through and I really thrived in it. I wasn't just like limping along. I was like, oh my gosh, I love my life alcohol free. And I wish that more women, even friends of mine, just like more women like me that are just kind of going and getting it done and, and doing it knew what I knew. If they knew what I knew, they may could make more empowered choices because I didn't know all this science existed. I didn't know that there was this uh, community of people that were really kind of this rebellious non-drinker, almost like, well, I can drink if I want to, but I'm choosing not to. Like that. You were like, you had now, you had the golden key to unlock the door for people and you wanted to do that, right? Yes, Wendy. I did. I did. I just felt like, you know, I could just live my little alcohol-free life and just kind of sit on this. Or I could use my story and my life to maybe help somebody else out there. Because if I'm feeling this and I've experienced this and I'm your pretty average, just girl next door, then I know that surely there's got to be other people Mm -hmm. that feel this way too. And I've I've seen a glimmer of that, but I have no idea like how many (laughs) now I do. Yeah, now you do. So 2018, you sit there and you say, you were talking to your husband, right? Yeah. And you said, what? I said, you know, I really think I want to share this with more people. And I don't know how to do that, but, you know, I guess I could just kind of curate and bring together some of the best of what I found that really worked for me and share my own experience. And he said, well, what do you want to name it? And I pulled out a piece of paper and I was trying, Wendy, you got to know this. I was trying everything in my power to not use the word sober or alcohol. Mm, Right. Because you don't like the word addiction. You don't like... And I was trying so hard. And some of that was my own issue at that time, just with the stereotype, the stigma, mm-hmm. the misunderstanding that I was now a sober person that I'd been like clean and sober for so many, you know, I just, some of that was me working through, but I also knew that the person I was trying to attract needed to hear different words as well. Right. So it wasn't just for my own story. It was for don't other tell people. Me I'm addicted. Don't tell me I I'm addicted to alcohol because I'm going to say no. I'm going to so say no. And I can't me, hear I'm, you. I, I needed to, to make it where people could yeah. hear me and, exactly. and get, get them in the door to understand that really, maybe they are slightly addicted to alcohol and sobriety really is awesome. But if I came at it from that angle, it'd be too much. It'd be too mm-hmm. intense. So I did come up with sober minded sisters. Um, in fact, total transparency, I was really going to name it sober minded sisters in Christ, because as a Christian, as a believer, I wanted to really niche out and talk to other Christians because I felt like it was so under served and under supported in churches because there's so much shame, so much judgment that there were so many Christian moms hung over on the church pew on a Sunday that they were really hurting. Cause again, that was me, but you know, God, God had bigger plans than, than, than the name I had. He said, Nope, that's a little bit too long. And I think I want to do a little bit more Jen than what you want to do. Like, were you Let's getting nudged? It. Yeah. Were I kind of got nudged. Okay. And, um, sober minded sisters in Christ too long. What about sober sis? Because then I know it means sober minded, I know that we're sisters. That's why it is sis. And in Christ, well, maybe people are spiritually curious, but maybe they're not a Christian. And that's okay. I know they're still struggling with alcohol. I don't think I want to narrow it down that far. I don't think I want to make my group exclusive. Exclusive. Right. In a a religious way. In fact, I wouldn't even consider myself religious. So I say that in my stuff out there. If y'all are like, oh, I'm not religious, though. I don't know if I can do Jen's program. Well, I'm going to bring my authenticity to the table, but I'm certainly not going to push that on anyone because that wouldn't be relational. (laughs) Remember, we talked about earlier about how God, I believe, is relational, not put put the thumb down and make you do something. That's not even freedom. So you said the opposite, like you want to connect people to this and the opposite of addiction 
is connection. Is connection. That's exactly right. Yeah. So trying to figure out how to connect with all these. No, people. I'm just wanting to connect with people. So I was really thankful. I could not believe it that it, December 25th, 2018, the URL for sober sis was not used or taken. There are so many wonderful sober accounts now and sober coaches and sober variety um, handles out there that this one uh, was just reserved for, for me and the group that God wouldn't end up building. Because well, now did your husband okay. find it? Wasn't your husband like in on, on the computer? Like, yeah, he's on his computer. And I was going to do a group like, you know, freedom fighters. And I was like, no, that's <laughs> like another, like, that really is a group of like in history. Which I was trying to get like the word like freedom. freedom and, but yeah. I thought if I just use the word, like just freedom, people won't know what I'm talking about. Right. I've got to use the word sober, alcohol, wine, something. And, and it just turned out to be, I think, what we needed. So you start with what? A blog? Like, how'd you start? Yep. Yep. So I wrote 30 days worth of emails and I, okay. I made them topical. Mm-hmm. And I literally, like I said, really leaned into all the people that I had learned from all the podcasts, all the programs, all the coaches that I had invested in that I had listened to. And again, there's so many, I mean, I'd read book after book. I bet I'm not kidding. I'd read two dozen books at that point, listened to 400 podcasts. You know, I was just so full of information that I would just put it in a, in an email format and talk about, you know, do you really need to be, do you really need to drink to be social? Uh, Mm -hmm. What about the sleep issue? Mm -hmm. Uh, What about a spouse that drinks when you're trying not to? These were, we should mention that John, Jen, we should mention that, that your husband didn't actually stop drinking. No, no. He is married to sober sis, but he's not sober bro. Right. I I found that interesting that even with him drinking in the house too, right? Oh yeah. 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 That you still didn't just it was a challenge. I'm not going to lie. I it was a real imagine. challenge. It was very difficult because it was an activity that we had together. So mm-hmm. I really peeled off. I really peeled off and got in my own lane. And it was, it was bumpy. Mm-hmm. It was bumpy there for a minute because I, we just, we had to rediscover how to connect without drinking being the synergy, because actually it really wasn't that connecting for us come to find out. Mm. It really wasn't that connecting, but the, the ritual of going to dinner and sitting on the patio yeah. and just talking that is connecting the actual drink itself and altering our minds slightly <laughs> or a lot uh, was not connecting. So interesting. Yeah. My husband always says like, I'm like, well, what's the end game for you? And he's like, I just want to. And he said this two nights ago. I just want to sit on my back porch, look at my land and my animals with my glass of wine. And I, I did. I thought of you. I go, ooh, we might need to rethink that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not. And as you get older, you don't process alcohol as efficiently either. So that's, that's another side. Thing. So he finds sober sis. And you start writing these. And, and if... I am excited for people to find you because when you get on, on sober sis and you start getting some of her words of wisdom, you write so well. And you put in these, like, um, like you said on the highway and you peel off or you're at the traffic light. You, you use these, these amazing ways to really make it relatable. Like, and I'm, I'm just so impressed every, and I'm like, how does she have, there's more information and she keeps, you keep just sending it out <laughs> and you're so creative. And I can't even imagine how much time you have to spend on it, but, but yeah. I digress. So, so you start off with these 30 letters, then what emails, how did you get, how did you distribute them? Well, I um, asked my friends here locally. I literally okay. went to kind of my drinking friends, if you will, those who had kind of, you know, I don't know about you, but I had friends that were like, we would drink together and then we would kind of commiserate together about drinking less, but none of us knew how. 
Oh no, so you're on the tennis see. court going and my partner would, would miss a volley. Oh, I shouldn't have had that third. Yeah, we, oh, that's that. exactly what we would do. So those were the <laughs> friends I was going for. I wasn't trying to get them to be necessarily non-drinkers. I just wanted them to know what I knew so that they could make more empowered choices. And yeah. so I invited them to read these emails, number one, just to see if they made any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I catch a few grammar issues. And, um, and just share and see how it resonates. So I started a little Facebook group at the time. It had 15 people in it. They all kind of semi might know each other. So that was a little bit awkward starting off. Like I didn't bring you in here because I think you're, you know, an alcoholic or have this huge drinking problem. I really just need people who I know are kind of maybe sober curious is kind of a word that's big out there right now. And so maybe just kind of curious about learning about drinking. So I, I pulled them in. They read my emails. I had one for the Super Bowl, one for Valentine's, very specific to February of 2018. Um, I wrote them in January and I shared them in February. That's okay. all I did in January, which is write, 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 write okay. and process, which was so helpful to my own journey. Yeah. Because I'm just yeah. processing out my own journey. Um, mm-hmm. And so I just shared it with friends who would listen. Uh, totally for free. Everything's for free at this point because I have no business. I have a URL. I mean, you can go to GoDaddy and get a URL pretty easy. It's not that yeah. hard. So right. I had SoberSys.com. I had no Instagram yet. I didn't even really know that much about Instagram mm-hmm. other than just showing my kids and my dog. Like I didn't know the power of putting your story out there. And so in March of 2018, I started the SoberSys Instagram account. And at this point, I'm a 47 year old catching my second wind. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to Instagram. You're just going with it. Like the flagstones are being set and you're like, okay, I'll step on this one now. I'll step on that one. And I quickly learned Instagram was this incredible networking community. Mm -hmm. And I would start following people and then they would follow me. And then I would see more hashtags. And it was just really amazing. And, um, Mm -hmm. and all the meanwhile, um, I'm giving away these emails for free to anybody right. who will read them. Right. Um, and I had people interested. So I was literally getting up at 6 a.m. and manually sending them from my Gmail account. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, oh can we gosh. say really grassroots here? Yes. No, I love that though. But that makes it so genuine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, organic yeah. And like all the things, right? Oh, yeah. So, so how did this, how did you get there to here? Yeah. Well, unfortunately that may be like episode two. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because there really have been so many progressive daily steps. I have been working on sober sis. I don't know how many hours a day, uh, 10 hours a day yeah. since February of 2018. Wow. Okay. So where are we now? And now have hired a team now have totally created additional programs to follow up and really create a journey for people, for women to follow through their whole first year of being alcohol free at the 21 day reset. Then I wrote a 10 week online course. Um, that was my 2020 project. So while people were, you know, getting drunk, uh, becoming During a the pandemic. Hunk. Yeah. <laughs> in 2020, I was really pushing myself to create something that again, I'd never created or, or knew how to do. But again, I invested, I invested in classes that taught me how to write a course. I hired business coaches, thousands of dollars. I began investing in building the infrastructure that could scale sober sis to reach more women. The goal always being, how can I get the message out to more women who are on their third glass of wine, cleaning the dishes? How yes. can I get to her? Yes. Yes. How can I get there? That's my heart's desire. I want to talk to the mama bear or the woman who's lonely or bored or the socialite who's like, I don't know how to do a fundraiser or socialize without alcohol. I want to talk to them Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there is a way and there's a way to do it that that is cool and fun and glamorous and part of the ritual you don't have to be left out um you can really make make a life for yourself that you really don't want to numb out from that you don't need the alcohol it becomes so small and devalued in your life 
that you don't need it and you're free from it. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. I'm back in here. I come <laughs> here. I come. Um, also I have just a couple more questions. One is what is the biggest takeaway for you since you've embarked on this, on this program? Wow. Since you've been like your biggest takeaway. Hold on. I'm going to throw a book at my dogs. Hold on. Oh, sure. Stop playing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. A little oh my mind. gosh. Like my biggest personal takeaway. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, what popped into my mind, this is like rapid fire questions, but what popped into my mind immediately is I do go back to one of my favorite Bible verses because I do love the Bible. And God talks about how he can do beyond anything that we could ever think of or imagine. And I am living proof of that. I would have never in my wildest dreams seen or planned what he has done. It has blown my sober mind. My sober mind is blown because it's so much more than what I could have ever pictured or imagined. It's been more challenging, more rewarding, more exhilarating, more impacting, more than I would have ever have dreamt. And I think that, you know, he gives us just enough light for the step we're on. And I think if he would have shined a Q beam and this big spotlight down the path, I probably wouldn't have done it. I would have been too intimidated. Yeah. Not quite what I had. I would have been like, you need somebody else. (laughs) I think you need someone more qualified, someone more, you know, just somebody. Whoa. But I think, again, my vision was there, but it was smaller than what was available. And I think just trusting daily for more, the territory continues to enlarge. And you're ready, right? And that's expensive. It expands. Yeah. Same, same girl. Yeah. Told me I would be doing this sitting here right now with you talking about this and my own issues. No, no way. No, No. I love how you said that. And that the light, the light is only where you, it shined only where you need. It's just shining for the next step. Mm. And literally that's how sober sis has been created. That's how this life of authentic freedom for myself has been created. It is literally just trusting God for that day. And that goes back to that very first book club and my friend's 50th birthday party and my first anniversary. It was just in the flight for the step I was on at that time. And I just kept taking the next step, doing the next right thing. And, and in that just, it's just been so much more then I, what a second act, what a second wind here. I just turned 50 this summer. I hit the big five Oh, and what a gift and a blessing to have such a mission and such a message and such a purpose. What a gift that is because, uh, I didn't see it coming. I just right. could not have imagined. So, right. and your heart humbling, full. it's overwhelming, it's tiring, but it's yeah. all worth it but it's exhausting in like such a different way. Totally. I lay my, my little head down on the pillow every night, sober minded, which is still a feat. (laughs) I mean, it's still like, I cannot believe it. Um, And I don't take that for granted how I wake up in the morning without regret. And, um, and I go to bed just knowing, you know what? I did my best. My best is enough. I get to try again tomorrow again tomorrow. Now, if you, now I always ask this question of everybody, cause it's so interesting to me when you, I mean, we all have those days when you, you're like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to try. I don't want to do, I just, ugh, ha, you know, for whatever reason. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, a mantra or something. What keeps you focused and moving forward? Ooh. Because you're sending out these amazing you know, drop the mic nuggets of stuff coming. Yeah. I do hope more women get on my email list, even if they're not sure about this 21 day reset, oh, they yeah. go to sobersys.com. You can get on my email list. Um, I, I'm trying to just get women on there. So if you're a dude listening, I don't know who exactly your audience is, but I'm looking for women uh, because women. I really do have a lot to share that are just kind of thoughts. Um, but one of the things my grandmother always said, you know, we got to bring in grandma, yeah. but we got it. One of the things my mama, Katie always said was Jen, first off, you can't copy an original, be yourself, be original. 
Everything else is a copy, but there's only one original. Be, be, be you. And be the change in the world that you want to create. You know, that, that famous line. I'm, I'm looking at it right now on my desk about like oh. a little sign. Uh, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I just think, you know what? There's so many things in the world that are broken, that are flawed, that need improving. And that's true in my own life. It's not just in the world at large. It's in my own life. But if I can change, if I can do it, I think somebody else can too. And so I guess that's what keeps me motivated. And just again, connecting with who I was and how I felt as I was cleaning those dishes on that third glass. I'll never forget her because she's still a part of me. Um, And I take her with me because I want to remember what it felt like to feel defeated and stuck in status quo. And, uh, and it just really does light my fire. It really does bring me passion to think, oh, wait, if I could go back and talk to her and say, hey, you don't need it. You really can break free. Uh, here's how you do it. And here's who you can do it with. I'll keep going for that person because there are thousands, if not millions. I love how you said that. It's like, I can see you. I see this picture of you walking up to the sink. Yes, with like you. tapping on her shoulder, there, tapping yes. on her shoulder, and saying, "Look, I have the, I have the key. Yes, I have the key to unlock the door, and it's going to change your it's going life. Going to change your life. Mm-hmm. Just take the first step. Oh, oh. yes, <laughs> it's so yes, good. it's so hopeful. Oh, there is great hope, and I know for many women, it's just felt like hopeless. Like, well. I just have to manage this better. I can't imagine not drinking. I'll just have to manage it better. That's exactly what's happening. I'm just here to say there's a better way. That's exactly what's happening every day. Right now, people, somebody's listening to it with a glass of wine right now going, hmm. Oh, for sure. And you're not a bad person and you're not weak-willed and it's not a moral failure. It's it's just the, the nature of the substance. It's part of our society and culture. And if you knew better, you could do better. If you know more, it's empowering to help you make those choices. And I want you to know that you're not alone. And there's so many others who are traveling on this journey with you. Yeah. You just How don't do people know each find other. You? Exactly. How do people find you real quick? I know we're going to put it all in the show notes. Yeah. We're going to have it on the website. We're going to have it in the emails and all the good stuff. Right. But real quick. How can somebody find you if they're like, on their phone right now trying to figure yeah. it out. Well, if you're on Instagram, go to Instagram and follow me at sober sis. Um, if you are where you can download or send something to your email, I would love to send you my free guide, which are kind of my top five strategies for navigating that five o'clock, that happy hour, that wine. Oh, o'clock. it's good. It's good information. It's really good. It's just like yeah. life stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's easy to remember. Sober mm-hmm. And then from there, I'll tell you more about the 21 day reset. If you, if you give me your email and let me send you that free guide, I'll be able to tell more people. And then we'll put the link for the 21 day reset below your video. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Jen, thank you so much for your time. Oh my gosh. Awesome. You're a great, you're a great person. And I'm so glad that you're part of our tribe and just really on this journey of self-discovery for yourself and helping so many others by just bringing it to the light, putting attention on it. Well, thank you so much. And you're doing the same thing. And, and, you know, I, I just, I can't wait to come visit you. I'm coming. Come on. I'm, making, I'm doing on. some tours. I'm going to go visit some people's. Make your Texas lives. We'll do a live. We'll do one of your, um, like your Facebook live when you do this, the drink mocktail thing. Oh yeah. Right on. Do one with me. I would love to. Would that be so much fun? I would love to. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, thank you again. It has been such a pleasure. I am honored to have shared your story and thank you. And until next time, breathe in your second wind. Thank you for listening today. I hope that something you heard made you smile, made you think, and made you feel. If these incredible stories empowered you, awakened you, or left you feeling inspired, make sure to share with a friend and write us a review on iTunes so we can continue to change lives through this content. Make sure you tag us while you're listening on our Facebook group, My Second Wind, 
or hit the link in the show notes to join the conversation. Until next time, go ahead and breathe in your second wind.